15 years ago, Rookery Bay saw an opportunity to look at the downstream portion of the Southern Golden Gate Estate Restoration Project, now <coughs> called the uh, Continuous Strand Restoration. Uh, so luckily enough, I was hired on to look at fishes downstream, and due to the slow pace that government projects typically move at, I've been able to collect over 10 years of fisheries data at this point, and I'm still sort of waiting for that water flow to change down back in now. So I've got this excellent baseline data set uh, comparing uh, three base systems downstream of the restoration project. Uh, I look at water quality at the sites that I'm sampling, but we also have a continuous water quality program uh, looking at uh, water quality every 15 minutes uh, every day of the year. And so that's an excellent way to uh, see what's happening in the uh, fish community by comparing it to the water quality. We've done, we've had uh, other investigators looking at bottom habitats, and I recently just started a more quantitative way of looking at uh, the trawl bycatch that I pull up. Um, I do both a trawl monitoring and a shark nursery monitoring project uh, that looks at the top predators in the system, fisheries-wise. And both these projects are slated to continue through, through the physical restoration and hopefully uh, after this restoration so I can compare post-restoration, pre-restoration conditions. Uh, Stan Locker from USF uh, created this picture which gives a very good overview of the drainage of the area. Uh, this is the Southern Golden Gate Estates area. It doesn't show I-75, uh, but uh, there's the Prairie Canal, Club Canal, Merritt Canal, and the fact Union and Miller Canal go underneath I-75 all the way up to North Collier County up to Immokalee Road. So this area is about 55,000 acres in the southern south of I-75. You can add, at least double it, and add another 50,000 acres or more of the watershed that drains into the Fackey Union Canal, past Port of the Islands, and straight into the Fackey Union Bay. So this is a heavily impacted site uh, due to this canal system that's been in since the mid-1960s. Um, my study focuses on this Fackey Union system, Pumpkin Bay, which has a very reduced watershed, which is only about this big, maybe five to 10,000 acres uh, flowing into this area. And then I also look at Fackahatchee Bay, and I use this more as a reference site, uh, which gets a fair amount of drainage down to the Fackahatchee Strand. Uh, this is the water quality loggers that we use for the continuous logging. And I mentioned that I'm also looking at uh, water quality on site. The top graph shows seasonal uh, trends in water quality. The red line being Fackey Union Bay always has the lowest salinities. These are just average monthly salinities from my trawls. And after about a year and a half into the project, I was seeing these differences on a seasonal basis and a monthly basis, but was curious what was actually happening on a daily basis with the uh, incoming and outgoing tides. So I set up data loggers just for a couple days at the mouth of the uh, freshwater sources and saw the same pattern in the wet season. With the fact union dropping very quickly down to zero, coming up with the rising tide. And these drops and rises occur in about 10 to 15 minutes at these set locations. So organisms in this fact union system are undergoing some very quick salinity changes. Uh, this year in 99, Pumpkin Bay showed very little change uh, around the, the mid-20 part of the thousand. And Fakihatchee always seemed to be somewhere in between the two. Okay, not as extreme of a salinity change uh, as Fat Union, but more of a natural uh, ebb and flow due to uh, its drainage of the Fat Union strain. Dry season, most of the base systems are similar, except that 
these water control structures that are up there, they're delaying the freshwater flow early in the wet season, and they're extending that freshwater flow late, early into the dry season, sometimes all throughout the dry season. So we do see these uh, fluctuations in salinity in the dry season in the fact that you bet some years it's more, more than others. And you can see there is annual variation throughout the years. Stan Locker also created these uh, with his uh, project that he did. These are uh, bottom classifications, and I know you can't read what they are, but uh, the light color, the this pale color here is basically barren of vegetation. Uh, blue is less than, light blue is less than 10% uh, clutter from his uh, side scan sonar. And uh, the greens represent uh, submerged aquatic vegetation. Uh, Fakihachi seems to have a fair amount of vegetation on the bottom. And, uh, uh, due to bycatch that I've pulled up, I've seen halophila, uh, a lot of drifting macroalgae, uh, sponges, that sort of thing. Uh, Back Union tends to have a very thick, silty mud layer on the bottom, and it doesn't support the growth of seagrass. Um, and I think due to the wide fluctuations in salinity, uh, the macroalgae doesn't have a good chance to proliferate. And Pumpkin Bay with its uh, reduced salinity changes, I actually get a fair amount of the submerged aquatic vegetation in the trawl, trawls themselves, in the bycatch. So here's some general graphs of comparisons of the trawl bycatch. And it's not quantitative, uh, I was just estimating the bycatch at the time, this is just presence or absence in each trawl and the numbers of times I've seen that bycatch. So this mixed algae is a lot of the, the drifting macroalgae that I see, uh, much lower times, number of times that I've seen it in the fact Union Bay compared to Fakihachi and Pumpkin Bay. Uh, Calerpa, same pattern. Sponges, very few are found in the Fak Union Bay, whereas Fakihachi Bay tends to exhibit uh, sponges <coughs> many more times. And then the Hlopala seagrass species are also found more often in fact hatching pump. Freshwater algae comes down through the canals over the last weir and down into fact the Indian Bay. Uh, green filamentous algae tends to be more prevalent in fact the Union. Mangrove leaf litter and propagules more often are, are found more often in fact the Indian Bay. Uh, sea squirts and other tunicates are very prevalent, and I tend the category of organic detritus is uh, more prevalent in fact Um I utilize volunteers for my crew. Uh, we do four trawl, random trawls in each bay system per month, and sort through our catch. Uh, I help the volunteers identify everything. They do the measuring, and I record those measurements. Uh, using a primer, which is a, a good ecological community-based statistical program, uh, when I looked at the yearly data comparing each phase system, uh, FAC Union, FAC Union uh, sample years Basically, all of them clump together at a, at a lower similarity level to both Pumpkin Bay and Fakihachi Bay. In fact, Union sits in between them geographically. So, obviously, there's uh, some sort of an effect from the canal system in the fisheries community data uh, due to that canal in the Fakihachi Union Bay. And in the last talk, you saw a few of these uh, multi-dimensional <coughs> scaling graphs. I've got the next few slides of these. And the point that I want you to look at is the fact union typically is separate from the groupings in most, and this is uh, broken up by a season, which is a, a three month season of the year, and they, and each graph represents one year. 
So in fact, union in the early wet season is more similar to late wet uh, sample uh, points in almost all of the years. You see it in this year also. Uh, it's tending to clump more with late wets here, also here, and sometimes uh, even in the dry season, the fact union points are well removed from the fact that actually pumpkin bay group. And this pattern occurs consistently over the years, not every year. Occurred here in 2004. Um, not really here, but you see that the fact union tends to uh, separate out from the groupings within seasons. Here, uh, again here in the late wet season. So because fact uni gets these pulses of water early in the wet season, these fish communities look more like they should in the late wet season. And that's occurring probably in July and August. So there's, there's this timing shift of, uh, due to the freshwater flow coming out of that canal, affecting the community structure of the fishes in these systems. And the last two years of data here, same thing happened here in 2009. Uh, not sure why my reference site there is all by itself. But, uh, <coughs> fact union, well removed from the late dry points there. So it's, it's an occurrence that happens quite often uh, throughout the study. You know there's a lot of numbers here. Uh, these are just mean abundances in the three different bays. These top 22 fish here all have higher abundances in Fakahatchee and Pumpkin Bay. And all the red numbers just means that it's highly significant. It's uh, non-parametric, so it's a crustal wallace uh, significance test. But uh, most of these are sorry, most of these are more marine dominated fishes. So it makes sense that they wouldn't be as prevalent in fact union bases. These down here have higher abundances in the fact union bay. Uh, sand sea trout, which is a typical estuarine fish, uh, can tolerate wide uh, salinity changes. A couple gobies here, and I'll exhibit that in the next graph, uh, have much higher abundances in fact union bay. Uh, Red drum in their early life stages uh, utilize the mangroves and the small tidal creeks. So they're quite accustomed to freshwater flows. And then there's even some freshwater species that I've found in the fact union bay, still alive, uh, usually in the wet season. Probably didn't last very long, but uh, they do make it down into the estuary, far into the estuary when that, with that canal water flow. So the gobies are showing highly significant differences. Uh, code goby prefers higher salinity uh, vegetation. Tend to find much, uh, many fewer go uh, code gobies here in the fact union bay. And it's opposite with the clown goby and the green goby, which prefer muddier substrates and can tolerate more salinities. But they, probably because of the mud substrate, they tend to hang out more in fact union bay. And they are, each goby is found in each of the bays, but there's definite differences between the bays, most likely due to the effects of the canal. It may not be strictly salinity. It could be the other effects, like the increased uh, nutrients being brought down by the canals, creating plankton blooms, which settle out, decompose, and create this fine, silky mud layer on the bottom. Again, a lot of information you probably can't read here, but just focus on the colors. This maroon color represents pinfish, and this color here represents maharas. And in the Fakahatchee Bay and Pumpkin Bay, in these earlier studies, pinfish seem to be the dominant species. Uh, this color here, this is uh, silver perch, and it's also a dominant uh, fish 
in these studies, same in here. And then even back in the early 1970s, Maharas seemed to be a dominant uh, catch. And this is maybe 10 years after water probably started falling down at now. And now, Maharas dominate in all base systems that I monitor. But the uh, percentages of the pinfish are a little bit higher here in both Pumpkin Bay and Fakahatchee Bay. So that even though these, uh, these studies here, they didn't use the exact same year, um, I had to take out some of the dominant species, such as uh, anchovies and uh, medjaden sardines, to look at the more benthic uh, associated fishes. Because some of these studies use surface crawls. Uh, my other project is looking at juvenile sharks, and it shows some very good uh, data. I use a 300-foot gill net and two 10-hook long lines. Since I'm only out there once a month, and it's just a snapshot of what's happening with these sharks, I'm trying to uh, get as much information <coughs> on out there. We do four length measurements, uh, take a weight, uh, determine sex, and species, uh, reproductive condition, and release condition. And for the past few years, we've also had a cooperative project with some veterinarians looking at the shark, the stress response in the blood parameters of the shark. <clears throat> Bull sharks are very adaptable to all salinities, and they don't show preference for any time of year, well, sorry, for any salinity, uh, I catch them when the salinities are very low. In the fact, in Bay, I catch them when the salinities are high. So each species of shark tends to have a, a typical range that they're found in. Fauna heads a little less, can accumulate uh, the freshwater less than the, than the bull shark. Lemon sharks, 15 to 40, part per thousand range. Black tits and nurse sharks I mainly find in the higher salinities. And when I compare catches by bay, bull sharks dominate the back in the bay uh, when the salinities are lower, below 25. Above 25, there's a more even distribution of all the sharks. But when that fresh water starts flowing down the canal, it keeps the other sharks away from that area, uh, except maybe one or two bonnet heads. Uh, so the salinity changes in fact union are definitely having an effect on the shark species distribution within that area. And if, when I broke it down by month and bay, you can see that the bull sharks tend to, uh, the peak year is in the summertime, so the, the bull sharks are, the young of the year sharks are showing up this time of year, and they're very dominant in, especially in fact, the Union Bay. Um, the bonnet heads here tend to be more prevalent in Fakahatchee and Pumpkin Bay, especially in the wet season months. And when the salinities drop, they're either moving to these other areas, maybe moving near shore. Uh, so with all the species in the Fact Union Bay, especially the ones that can't deal with low salinities, they almost disappear from the Fact Union basis in the wet, wet season, especially the late wet season, August, September, October. And nurse sharks, I'm only caught one in the Fact Union Bay, and that was in the late dry season. So all, all of these fishes are, that I've shown you here are showing differences, sometimes significant. Um, there's probably 80 other species of fish out there that I'm catching that may not be showing differences, either because the catch numbers are too low or they're very tolerant of salinity changes within the estuary. Um, I always need to acknowledge the Shark Foundation for their support of the Shark Nursery Project and all of my volunteers over the years. I see a few here in the audience. Um.
Um, this, a lot of people have quantified vegetation change as it comes, like that's the goal of the project. What I've ended up with is a geodate base that we developed over time from multiple funding sources. Um, starting out when I was a class high tech, at the paint reference $10,000. We started out mapping exotics. Um, then they contracted us to finish it afterwards. And then recently it's been great. I uh, got funded with the uh, Rippery Bay and the growing. And the final funding source was a lot more fun because, because I already worked out. You know, I learned a little bit on the way. Of course, I learned more along the way here too. So um, and that's why I say the objectives. It wasn't like there was a clear objective. Um, mapping exotics, and of course, when you're mapping exotics, you start seeing habitat associations. And because I want to do as much as I can, I start collecting habitat data while I'm out there anyway. I think the only person that that collects more variables than me in the woods and walks a little slower to stand in the back there. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't have any public. <laughs> we tried. Um, so then started seeing vegetation shifts and um, started trying to add more to the database. And um, you know, we started out with aerial photographs and public pencils, but then back at the camp refuge when we had the units started playing around with ArcPad and the GPSs, and so things were evolved. Um, but anyway, started focusing a little more on um, CO and saltwater trees from hydrological changes upstream. So, um, so now, you know, I was focusing more on look, trying to figure out what, what was there in 1940 and what is there now, and what are the you know, what are the vegetation shifts that have happened there? And also because there's so much more software available now for um, <coughs> taking imagery and classifying the imagery, we're also trying to take the ground truth database that we're collecting in old-fashioned field biologist methods and trying to put it in a way where we can start expanding it out. So that's a big goal of mine now is to make this database useful for any of y'all that want to actually start applying it um, to identify the signature of other forms. So just keep in mind that these methods came from a field exotic control point of view and not starting out from quantifying vegetation changes. It's just something that I'm trying to try to look um, Again, that's the, what I consider the big value of the actual ground truth database is um, to help in um, using some of this other software. Um, I did do some unsupervised um, classification early on when people started playing with the software and I was turned off by it and then from a field perspective because I knew what it, I had already been there what it was classifying. But things are a lot better now, um, so it's, it's time to start applying this and moving forward too. Um, okay. Um, I got as many existing layers as we can get. Um, we have awesome aerial photographs in Cotter County thanks to rapid development, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the 1940s, USGS did an awesome service to everybody by putting those online as best georeferences as they could. They're low. Um, LIDAR, the most recent LIDAR is like, it's changed my life. <laughs> <laughs> the earlier LIDARs were just a little too sloppy and they, and they didn't work for me and this stuff was great. Um, and of course the software continues to get better. Um, I'm using Microsoft Access and Queries, not because it's the best thing to be analyzing geodata with, but that's what I've been using and I can run the queries. Um, so, you know, I wouldn't push my methods on anybody, but I can do queries and access and I'll see so I'll see what it is. Um, we're using the search vegetation classification system. Um, that has been the best classification system that I've been able to use so far here. Of course, I um, appreciate all you guys that were involved in it. And of course, with classification systems, there's always room for improvement. And there's always difference of opinions, but this is a hierarchical ability, so that really are very helpful. Um, so, so now I've ended up with like 30,000 record polygon geodatabase that was hand digitized. You don't just hand digitize 
30,000 polygons overnight. And <laughs> I'm kind of hoping that my digitizing days are going to be less and less as this new software, as we've already got enough ground truth and data to expand on. But early on, it was, you know, it was like, well, so I half the things that go in my ear get lost so that work smart, not hard, I think I just ended up to work hard on it. Um, so, anyway, this is the, hopefully it's something y'all are familiar with this, but um, there's a million ways to skin a cat, but I like this one best. Um, speaking of unsupervised, um, <laughs> these are the, the new codes that I came up with. A lot of them are just basically areas, large areas of transition between different habitat types that was the proverbial um, round peg into the square hole thing, so I just, uh, just came up and I, I keep lots of notes of what's actually out there so that if any of y'all get this data, you might be able to squeeze it into a, a different category. And some of them were just like a buttonwood woodland with leather fern. That became a pretty dominant um, ecosystem type out here. Um, I don't really like flying that much, so I'm <laughs> to submerged. Um, so basically started playing around with ArcPad in 2005. Um, the person that witnessed me beginning to learn wanted to take that and stomp on it and say, come on, that would be Dennis. <laughs> Early on it was a pretty painful process, but we moved away from that. Now Dennis actually will use it. Um, I'm getting my field data with polylines more so than with points for ground truth so that when I enter a habitat type, I start screaming, and when I leave it, I start screaming because when you start looking at points with signature interpretation, you can be like, okay, well that's the point, but how far does it go? And with the screaming, you can get it. And a lot of people, when you're actually quantifying, or you're actually mapping, the first thing you're saying, well, how, what is your pixel size or whatever? Well, when I'm in the field, I've generally found that you know, if I'm specifically mapping vegetation and not doing other things and I'm doing ideal time budget, um, I typically find in the field for my line data, five meters is sufficient for me to pull it out if there's a specific habitat type. When you actually go to digitizing and then extrapolating out from ground truth theory, of course, that's not, a, not possible, but it's, that's always been my goal. And again, I'm coming from a field use from exotic control method of, you know, five meters of solid pepper next to a prairie is, is, is significant. Um, but, so this is the data, that's kind of a summary of the database that we've ended up with a number of records. And, and uh, one of the things to point out um, is the kind of miscellaneous points. And with the uh, polyline tracking, we've added, um, I've started adding fields for the past vegetation type. And then for the miscellaneous points, I started GPSing the extent of dead wood and habitats. And that's really the, my attempt at ground truthing the past, which is something that you can't do flying in the air. Um, and this is just an idea of why, and when you work in a thick view, um, you know, you just can't help but note this when you're in a catapult woodland. Um, and then I've started doing this in thick view, so you got to remember the camp region. And this is the saltwater intrusion areas on this extreme southwest corner. And so you know, it's, there's all these examples of vegetation changes, which that doesn't show up from the air or from the aerial photographs. So we're trying to get both. And so this is the same type of thing that we're GPS and elsewhere. You've got the vegetation shift well underway. Um, and we're trying to map the extent of that in current and past time. So we're overlaying things like um, standing dead sags onto the signatures. Um, and then you can see this up in there here. Mangroves. As you can see, in 1940s era photographs, it's hard to interpret what the signatures are just based on that. Um, but when you start overlaying clues like that, and then you start um, you start seeing the, that this shift zone is moved up, the mangroves moved up, this is 
Sharon, this is a this is a place that would be affected primarily by sea level rise, and it's an isolated hydrology. And of course, I spent hours going back and forth like this. Just <laughs> 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 start to see the patterns and you start to follow the signature changes and these I don't have on the label a lot of times I label in parentheses the past habitat type. I leave pre-development habitat type blank if there's no clues. I only fill that populate that data if there's a clue in the field. And of course we don't get clues for groundwood versus um, you know we get groundwood versus woody cover pretty easily from the 1940s area but we don't species level type stuff, but we can get buttonwood, lighter pine, um, cypress, <laughs> woods that take a long time to decompose. 1940 seems like a long time ago, so <coughs> for, for young people like me. Um, <laughs> but it's really not very long in terms of ecology and plants and dead wood. Um, so these are just the kind of shifts that you know are easy to GPS, but we wouldn't necessarily pick up on um, signatures. Um, these you definitely have to pick up unless you're on the ground. Um, and this is more or less lighter pine with the mangroves well, well taken in. I don't really see any young pine seedlings here. Um, and you can even pick out cerebral reptiles in areas. I first started picking out dead cerebral reptiles on Little Pine Island in 95. Um, you know how old that is? What's that? You know how old that is? Well, no way. I mean, it's. But it's surprising that something fibers like that actually hangs around that long. I mean, because there's no sign of, of living in Saranoa in the area. Um, and the same with sable palm. It, it's a, um, so you know, we're trying to GPS these things wherever we're at. And, um, um, and then you can see I mean, they're long gone. The sable's long gone from these areas. But it's surprising what you stumble upon. Um, I mean, you, you see this, and you're like, wow. And you actually get down, to, and you can dig each of those rings, and um, you can find the fibers of, of capture palm. And this was on Halloween, by the way, so that's my ghost of uh, saving the forest. <laughs> Halloween last year. Um, and dead buttonwood lasts forever, and you just whack a machete into it, and you can tell buttonwood from all this other thing. It's close relative. The Gunkularia is the tougher one. And this is, again, real common scene. <laughs> and waiting for me to play with Please tell us coming up. Would you hurry up the GPS? Please. <laughs> um, and this is just showing like some of those changes with isolated hydrologies. This would be the, the hardwood area. This would be a combination of salt flats and buttonwood. This is where we hiked in. We were GPSing with the line data of the past up here at some points, but for the, you know, like some of the limits here. But you can see kind of like the rings of the back of the mangroves moving in the salt flats, the, the hardwood area shrinking. There's a, you can actually see the active zone of, of dying going on in those areas too. But so those are the kind of things that we're trying to nail down. And then the hand digitizing, um, which is, there's two levels to this data. There's the digitizing and there's the line data. And you can take the line data and do a lot with it too. So anyway, you get the idea where that's dead out of saying, yep, it is dead black mangrove, but I want to make sure there's no buttonwood or anything else out in these areas. Um, the outer islands, you can't really ground truth what's underwater, but the outer islands are definitely retreating. Um, and we've seen it just from year to year campsites. That's a, I didn't take pictures of it when it was more of a shade tree, but we had a swing on it that year and then the next year the water and it's you know, a lot of erosion, a lot of coastal burn erosion that's um, considered to be actually if you follow along this stuff more of a rate of sea level rise, not typical storm erosion. Um, but that's okay, so that's round key, that's round key now. Um, but anyway, so there's the field database that we've got. A lot of this is, is done by other folks and I continue to combine the data to new thoughts. So that's a lot of the new habitat. Um, but these are the areas that we're focusing on, which are, um, that's Fort Rooker Bay, 10,000 10, islands split up. Um, there's a lot of miles of long foot. Um, 
brown shrimping there that's tedious, but again, it's over periods of years. Um, we're focusing on complex areas, um, and that's actually more valuable because there's more habitat types, there's more elevation, there's more exotics, there's more signatures. So with the line data, um, you know, we can we can do a lot both for hand digitizing and for the, for the classifications. Um, but you know, we can also just do buffer distance because I've started doing average site distance for by each of the CERT codes that we're coming across and we can easily do buffers. I've done it once, I haven't done it with the recent new data that we've gotten. But you can do your image classification and some of the supervision, you can just use that data alone and run it on multiple areas. Um, but I'm still doing hand digitizing because <coughs> that's uh, what I'm good at, I guess. Um, but it's, you know, it's, it's valuable because we have, you can't you can't overlay the 1940s aerials yet very easily with the automatic um, image classifications in the database format that I've got. Um, so we're working on it, but that's kind of what we're ending up with. And there's this again, I don't show the label of the past habitat types, but there's areas here that are now black mangrove um, that are, oh yeah, here you've got like WMCS, WMC, and then you've got WMAS that was former WMC for the dead, dead wood. Um, but in, with the aerials, in the 1940s especially, there's a lot of variability. And with the images, it's, it's tough. Um, you can see this is pretty good quality. That's just plain out of focus, and you can't really make a tail of it. Also, it's important to, our layers are with the current aerials, but I, I go back to past years for clues. Um, especially picking when people lived out there in 2000, those areas were great for the home sites and exotics. Um, but for these events, I relied on the 2002s to identify um, black mangroves time and time again. I just flipped back to 2002 because black mangroves don't freeze back. And it's like, why? Well, is that black or is that buttonwood or what is it? Just flip back and say, okay, I know. This brown, this was not black mangrove. That was either white mangrove or um, buttonwood. And then I've gotten pretty good at recognizing the signatures from times ground through. And also, when you get things like control burns, it really shows that scrub area really well. So the important thing is don't limit yourself to the most current area. Most people do that. And then the LIDAR, this data, I mean, it's just fantastic um, what it shows us. And of course, I had to check that signature out. <laughs> Um, so this is the results. Now, I'm not going to go over a lot of the results and stuff. A lot of you know the big changes, marsh to mangrove and some of the other little changes that I've showed you. But what I'm trying to show you is the methods that went into this hand digitizing. This is what I've got digitized so far for the current. Um, the red is where I've fallen short. Um, so I guess uh, Greg Curry's going to finish all that. Go <laughs> Greg! <laughs> 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 But uh, I want to keep going on this. And of course, when you're close to the areas that are ground proof, that's where I have more um, precise data. And then it's extrapolated out from there. And, and we can then, you know, again, that's where we've got to go. Um, these are examples of, on a close scale where you can see the These are the black mangrove die off areas, which is a, a whole other subject which I'd like to talk about. Um, but it's. You can see that since 1940, a lot of these center basin areas have um, died off, whereas the higher elevation areas have filled in with black mangroves. So it um, seems to be a pretty common trend. What will happen in the future, there's many different factors involved, but it's things to keep our eyes on. Um, so that's what it looks like when you get the polygons on it. And you can see the, the changes here around the, uh, the, the higher hardwood. And the die areas. That's the exotic thing. I'm also keeping track, track of exotics. Remember, that's what started this whole um, vicious cycle. Um, so then ignore the blue open water. I've been too lazy to change that. You don't really ground truth open water. Um, but it's kicked out of my analysis anyway. But these are the ground truth polygons. And it's a pretty good data set. And that's what I'm hoping that if anybody uh, 
um, is ever interested in trying to apply that to some of the, the image stuff. And I know Jill Schmidt at Rupert Bay and I are hopefully going to play around a little bit with some of the, the ERDAS capabilities. Um, but now I'm, this is just about done with the talk, and I'm just this is just a brief summary of some of the queries to change group. And again, it, it's the reason why I'm doing this in a geodatabase with this hand digit heading, so I can easily look at habitat to habitat, not just total acres of marsh to total acres of mangrove. This is something that will give specific groups. And of course, the first thing that you see is a general loss of marsh, and that's been happening all across South Florida. And there's multiple factors, and there's, there's areas where hydrology and other things are, uh, um, you know, we're, so it's, but one thing I want to point out with the CM, that's scrub mangrove, marsh to scrub mangrove. In the 1940s, sometimes it's hard to tell what's scrub mangrove and what's marsh, and so a lot of it gets lumped to marsh. So the top category is hard to show specifically what's going on. Scrub mangrove meaning scattered mangroves. But in general, you can see in the 1940s, there's a lot more scattered mangroves, even in the scrub marsh mangroves, than there were in the 1940s especially due to fire suppression, but also on the lower ends with shrub mangroves moving in. Um, with, it all has, I mean, the, the sea levels come up you know, roughly this much in that time period. It's obviously going to have an effect on everything at this, this level. And then the, I'm sure that Tack Union Canal, even though it affects fish, I'm sure it has no effect on the marshes in our area at all. <laughs> <laughs> so fire suppression is huge, too. Those scattered mangroves, the scattered mangroves, you know, we could knock a lot of that scrub mangrove and marsh right back with fire. Um, we have a lot of fire suppression. Um, but um, anyway, so those are some of the big shifts. And then down here, these are some of the, the uh, shifts that would actually affect plant diversity more than other things. And that's the, uh, the change of um, Hydric pine on the lower ends of these pine rises to change to buttonwood. Buttonwood's obviously moving up in those areas. I mean, it's, and that's what we're trying to ground to. But from a plant diversity perspective, those are the big things. This, uh, um, where is it? Marsh to shrub mangrove, of course, is, is a, a big, big factor, too. I mean, that's huge. These, these areas of white mangroves, just walls of them, and you can see where they've moved over the years, and you can actually follow the aerial photographs through time to see it's kind of a gradual thing. Um, and I know y'all have started doing some monitoring in the National Park for that, too. And, and of course, um, I'm not talking about the causes of any of these specific changes. I'm sure I'm forgetting some of the big changes, like you saw two um, acreage-wise. Um, the flat mangrove basins to open water and mud. And, and these analysis, by the way, when I'm analyzing like this, I've dumbed up the uh, cert codes. I'm down a lot further in the field and in the polygons, but to analyze compared to 1940, we have to lump a lot of things. That's why you see a lot of these slashes and lumps. And so to get kind of big picture changes. But the beauty is, is in the future, we don't have to go back that way because we can compare it to our current data at a lower level and see more specific changes. So that's something that maybe I won't be around for. But, um, I'm trying to leave a database for somebody to, to go back in the future. Um, and then this is the actual ground truth polygons, so it's obviously lower acres. Um, I consider that ground truth to be digitized polygons, so it's more accurate, but still the, the changes are much the same. Um, and again, the, the pine flatwoods and the catch palm to buttonwood. Um, so it's, uh, this is just a couple pictures of the marsh. In case you don't believe me, that's marsh, that's not marsh. Um, this is a heavily impacted site. You can actually see the sawgrass. On rare occasions, I will put a lower level in 1940s, and I'm calling that sawgrass in 1940s. You can see the gray signature still up here. It's long gone, the mangroves have moved in here. Uh, there was cypress upstream here and sawgrass marsh here, and now it's having impacted. But you can actually see some, sometimes, sometimes the 1940s areas are great. But you know, big, big changes in the landscape when it comes to, to marshes and stuff. And again, I talked about the, the sea level change and the, the mangrove 
um, are the changes are obviously not solely due to sea level, there's multiple factors depending where you're at. Um, <laughs> thanks, so many people. <laughs> um, I had to put Dennis's picture because Dennis has been in the field with me doing this more than anybody else. Um, Beth recently so began helping me with the digitizing and everything, which has been a huge help because I had to get up more than I could chew. <laughs> Everybody that's been involved in directing funding to this and everything, it's, it's, been, a, it's been a real joy to get out there in the field and, and Hopefully, anybody wants to help with, with data work, like, I want to be out there in the woods tripping over uh, dead trees and cheap the other ones. I think he collects a lot more data than I do. He gets it up on screen. Mine sits in notebooks, and I'm running data on it. Dennis is going to keep you on track by doing the uh, PowerPoint. He's it just fails miserably with Mike Barry. <laughs> 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 but anyway, so I'm going to try. Uh, thanks for all the help, Dennis. And, uh, to me, is a wizard on this stuff, but of course I'm not that good at it. But, so it's a relevant term. <laughs> <laughs> this picture, first off, is uh, I believe, is this Jim Woodard? Always I can get credit to the time. Uh, but the whole topic is restoration of the California orchid or the cigar orchid. And otherwise called bee swarm work. The first time I ever saw one of these, this is taken at everybody's national park, was Larry Richardson took me to his panther refuge right within the first six months that I started panther refuge. I met mean, back in Hatchie, early 94, and he showed me why not quite that big. And uh, he said, Mike, this is a Calmore or a cigar or a Latin name. And I looked at it and I looked at him and I said, Larry, that's not an orchid, that's a palm tree. I mean, these things are so big and fan like. So this orchid is very, uh, very impressive. We don't have anything that big. Uh, the second was we wanted to talk about the era of exploitation was kind of like 1900 or so. So about 1974, we chose that date because that's the year the Big Cypress National Preserve and the back at Strand Preserve State Park were officially a sap or so. We were there. Uh, this was uh, taken by James Valentine, the Central School within the back at Strand. And we really couldn't even embark upon this restoration project without first doing many years of what we call Central Sioux Surveys. We started them annually, usually in March, around 1999. And by, uh, let's see, it was usually three days and two nights out there in the swamp. We got to the lazy lake and we were staying in the cabin. You know, we used to build in uh, tents and uh, we call it hammocks. Uh, they hang in. Uh, hang in. Mosquito cabin. Mosquito cabin. <laughs> we usually have about 10 people, sometimes 12, and three, four, four groups. Some people are very fast, like John Kalfarski here up front. John has found his share of these Calvin workers. But we're out there documenting and collecting data on um, the, uh, the uh, danger of epiphytes, the really experts, orchids, pepperoni, and anything like that. It's kind of a great time. So finally, by 2007, we had 17 known cowboy orchids. We added two more by 2009, one of them by Dennis, one by Chris Little. So we were up, we started the project with only 19 known uh, cowboy orchids. And then we got a call or an email in December of uh, 2006 by Matt Richards from the Atlanta Botanical Garden. He had been out with us on a swamp walk and realized that back Hatchie Strand is the orchid capital of the United States. So we asked if he might be able to allow the, uh, or we might want to work with them as a partner to help one of our orchids, or maybe more than one. We wanted to help a couple other, but they are found in Cuba, and that's just politically a little bit hard to deal with right now. So we decided upon uh, the Calvin orchid since it was in uh, dire need of help. I think, Larry, do you have like 30 or 40 in the Panther Refuge? No, I don't think I have that many. I'm not pushing maybe 20. Wow, we're about the same yeah. so far. And Big Cypher, Jim, you have about maybe 70-ish, 50? Yeah, at least, yeah. Okay, maybe 100. So I mean, just to give you an idea of how rare this is, ghost orchids, which you think is, all, is rarer than that, we've documented 367 yeah. ghost orchids. So this is far rarer than the ghost orchids. And at least it's charismatic. <laughs> this, this was one of the first ones we worked with. What was this, Serpon 1, April 2007? It was just Dennis and I. Uh, Dennis was the pollinator. He had to be the insect person. I was the note taker. I'm glad to do that. And this is just a close up of a flower. And uh, you just take a little twig or toothpick, take the polonium, put it in. I didn't know where the little pointer is. You might want to do that part, Dennis. But uh, it is in the part of the flower. <laughs> And then all you do is take one pollinia out of a pollinaria, I'm getting the word right, and then that sticky surface just under the bottom of the column will replace that. These are just one pollinia from inside a pollinaria. Pollinaria, I'm going to This is Matt Richards. He finally came here a little bit later on in 2009. 
But 2007 is when we actually started, and uh, we were not successful. 2008 went back there, and there were no seed pods. It was just dead flowers. So, but we did learn that month of the year, and that we did have at least one plant that made flowers. The other ones were, were just way out the top. And we had two plants that were fairly close together. So that's we tried to, uh, to use those two. And then, so the second year, which was April of 2008, we utilized some a common donor which we get paid BCMP. And this year there's one here 11 miles east of the Fakahashi. He said, if it's in bloom, I'll grab, gather some pollen area from that, and we'll have one more plant for our genetic diversity inside the preserve. And we, we made it with CP13 on April 10th of 2008. And that's in Fakahashi. And uh, we also went to Serpon 1. I didn't have a standardized uh, naming system at the time. So the Cody Book is number one, which was found, I think, by Mike Lucas. And uh, so on April 10th, we did pollinate that one as well. So at the end of our 2008 year, we had pollinated uh, CP13 with pollen from BCMP1 and Serpon 1 with pollen from CP13 and Serpon 1 with pollen from BCMP1. Trying to get a little bit of genetic diversity. And then we didn't know until April of 2009 that we had some success. And are those proud parents or what? <laughs> and, and this, I have to say, we didn't smoke the cigar. <laughs> and the seed pods that is just incredible. I think it is the record, if I, if I remember correctly, 3.2 million seeds in one of these pods. It's incredible. I don't know who counted them, but it must have a certain number or something. So this is Matt. Matt is really the pollinator extraordinaire. Dennis was successful. He got one. Matt came online in 2009. And that's when we really started going to lots of different plants, and that's when we realized we actually do have bloomage. So lots of flowers and lots of different pollination events, and then the, it just accelerated from there. Uh, of course, Matt knows how to do it, you know, make the pollen go where it's supposed to go there, too. So this is 2009, already 20 days after pollination, you can see we're getting swelling in the formation of one of those seed pods. And uh, what we would do is we'd collect the seed pod, and then uh, Matt would get the seeds. He only takes, I think, a thousand seeds. Remember, they make 3.2 million. So he takes maybe a thousand or two thousand seeds to have them there at the botanical garden. And then he sends them back to us. And then Dennis and I go back and put the seed pod, usually hanging at 10 or 12 feet high, above the parent plant to give it a broader dispersal. Because a lot of our plants are on cypress stumps. They're only three, four, or five feet high. So that even if they do use the seed pods, the seeds are not going to disperse very far. That was part of what we were doing too. The other part was we did take some of those seeds, just hand sprinkle them around cypress trees mainly, but other trees, mainly stumps and cypress trees. And we tried to meticulously document which trees, so we can go back to them later on. And you can see just a sprinkle of seeds. We're hoping that the seeds on you know hitting the right surface of my horizon. This is Dennis putting the, one of the first seed pods, I guess, above the plant. Parent plant, you can see it on the bottom left. And on this one you can even see some seeds popping out of that. So we chose that one. And this one was from CP13, our uh, Circle of <coughs> Cypress National Reserve one. All these others failed. So this big cypress plant was just an incredible plant, genetically. And so its genes are represented in the gene pool. You can tell two months later that the thing had a seed pod. Then we, uh, CP18 was dubbed by Matt Richards, the uh, person from the Atlanta Botanic Garden that offered his services and their services. That was the product. He uh, calls this Big Mama. This is such an incredible plant. So CP18, RCJK, that's Russ Cusman and John Kalfarski discovered this plant. And you can see what happens when you put these things together. You have two seed pods from one plant, which is JK01, that's John's plant, and another seed pod from BC09, what we we'll call it back there in 2009. This was another plant uh, that uh, Don Glansmite had found in 2007, and it wasn't looking really good in 7 or 8. This picture was taken in LA. By 09, it's almost dead, so we had it removed. And Matt took it back to the Atlanta Botanical Garden and nursed it back at all. So you can see what it looks like in just June of 2009. And so we put that back in 2008, just one year later. And of course, we had to celebrate again, but again, no cigar. <laughs> Cigars on the tree. <laughs> so that was exciting. And uh, this year, we did decide to move it up a little higher uh, at the advice of Ron Deere. He suggested that we kind of take out the basket and put it up a little bit higher than those roots in here. But it looks great even at that time. So another piece of success with this product, so it's very exciting. And then uh, this is one of our last ones we discovered. Dennis found this. What happened was, I've got to add this here, I was going too slow because I was taking notes again, which I'm somewhat known for. Dennis looks around and says, Mike, would you hurry up? And he looks up and sees the sombrero. We had to go with the sombrero. It's all the way around the cypress tree. And it is incredible. It's one of our largest orchids. And look at that. It even has seed pot. So the real insects are out there pollinating as well. It's not just Matt Richards or Dennis out there. 
problem model. That's the close up to C plot. And it's the first application of, of our knowledge that they naturally produce C plot in the fact. And then you also have here, 2009, Matt put out these little mycorrhizae traps just to find out about the native or indigenous mycorrhizae that might be on different tree surfaces. So we try to pop ash, pond apple, cypress, all different types of trees to find out if they're out there. And then I think this happens. <laughs> <laughs> With all the spring play that we did the year before, we've actually got a, a juvenile or a seedling popping out of a little pot ash there. And uh, we're all excited. I don't know if we're able to insert the video. It's pretty exciting. Like, we couldn't quite get a video. But you can see Matt, I can't believe it. How did that thing get in there? Well, Dennis is pretty good at sprinkling these little seeds around from the pot. And remember, they make 3.2 million. Matt only takes about 1,000 or 2,000. That leaves up with about 3.18 million. <laughs> so there's a lot of seeds that sprinkle around these, these areas. And so we, we think that's the first time I've ever seen uh, you know, seeds. So we're pretty sure that's what we did. So 2009, you can see how busy of a season it was. The pollination count, and we did collect one seed pod. So that really spurred the project on. And uh, this is Ralph R. Wood, who actually took some of these pictures too. And we actually, another part of this project was Matt is always telling us that these plants love sun. And uh, so I, I just hate pruning things out there, but Matt really got us more than pruning. So we're pruning back ferns and palms and strangler figs just to get more sunlight uh, to the plant. They really do need that. <clears throat> and you can see incredible seed pods. This is John's plant again. It takes about three or four hours of hiking to get to this plant. So you know it had to be a valuable plant for us to include it in the front of it. And uh, sure enough, the thing produced seven, 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 seven. See, I'm not following the scripts. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, there's a map up there at the Sombrero, the CP19 BG for Dennis, and uh, this April 23rd. And I think you did get buzzed by a bee of some sort. So I'm that was the pollinator. But Matt produced several, I think, uh, maybe not on that particular plant. But that's how he designated them. So we've kept a really good stud book so we know who we get who. <laughs> and we did release seed pods. <laughs> and then more manual seed dispersal, where Dennis is just putting it wherever he thinks those microrising might be. Um, and again, trying to keep track of that kind of stuff, but we know about where we put them around each plant. Lots of pollination attempts to get lots of genetic diversity so that each plant is represented. Seed pods produced, look at what happens when Matt gets involved. Those are the seed pods produced. We only collected, I think, six that year, six or seven. So a lot of them we just left hang there if they were high enough so the seeds would disperse naturally. There were a few that the pods were just too low. So we actually detached them and put them up higher. And that way when we did, we were able to see them even more. The other exciting part about this project was there was the loss or reduction of a, again, capital market from a cypress dome north of the interstate about 11 miles east of, of Fagahatchee in the Cypress National Reserve. So BCMP1 was removed by the time Dennis went to look at it, February 26th of this year. And uh, it is gone. So we we thought we'd say something like the shadows of the era of exploitation remain. <laughs> to remember that. <laughs> and, and the era of exploitation begins, we think, we're just uh, saying that April 19, 2011, Matt brings 88, actually 98 total plants of seedlings from CP13 with PCNP1. So the first generation, Matt creates his uh, what, cigar backpack? He's <laughs> all these cigars in the back. He was able to really travel long distances, incredible. Uh, and then, of course, they're putting them up in all kinds of places. Now that we know they can grow out of pop ash, or even including pop ash and pond apple, but cypress was the primary tree that we used. So that's CP13 with DCMP1 in April. So that's kind of what we like to think is the year of restoration for the power of release effect of energy. And they put them in sphagnum moss. It's a little different project than what I think uh, Larry is doing with the endosymbiotic mycorrhizae. I think Matt's still using the old fashioned cure. Uh, where you're not using symbiosis or the endosymbiotic mycorrhizae. So we're hoping they catch <laughs> and find the right place. So we don't know what survival rate will be, but that's one of the things that we're going to have to keep walking for. We did take two pictures of each plant, one close up and one far away. So that would help us when we're out in the field each year to document how, how they're doing. Plus, we have GPS locations on all the plots, too. And so we just called it outplanting. But again, always each year replacing those seeds to let them float to the wind. And then this is our worst looking one when we check it back in uh, July of this summer. And the better looking ones are doing just fine out there. So we're hoping survival rate will exceed 50% within one year. And so just all kinds of places that we're trying to put them. And you can see the, the sizes. This was a natural one, from, probably from the core. And that's Matt comparing one of the same age that it uh, was weird with one we think. We, started by just uh, placing the seeds out there naturally the year before. But well, this plant was two years old. 
These are same age. Three years. Three years. And so, oh, and here we go. Now, this is one Ralph Harley took. We're in an old growth cypher stand here. And you can see Dennis is way up there, about 30 feet. And uh, he's pointing at one of the calamore orchids. So we have to place 98 of these calamore orchids into the back of hash. You can see another very busy year in 2011 of continuing to try to outcross, especially to try to improve those that have not been represented just yet uh, genetically and not as many seed pods. We we're always very careful not to produce too many seed pods in one plant to do one to curate the health of the plant. But uh, we met the one that John found called uh, uh, Big Daddy actually produced seed, seven seed pods. And we didn't mean to do that, but fortunately, Matt said, this plant is incredible, I call it Big Daddy. And uh, it can handle it, and it produced flowers. Uh, I believe even the next year, it did produce some, I didn't know. So these plants kind of regulate the number of flowers they produce, I guess. And so in 2011, we did take out planting to 98 plants total. We can get them back out there. And another thing is, we're going to have to work with Jim Birch to find a, get a permit so that we can release the largest offspring from that too. We'd like to be able to put back out in the cypress dome. So we saved the biggest trying to restore. That was the good news. Hopefully, the era of exploitation is going to be more of the shadows, more the era of restoration. Our 2012 objective is, of course, to refine the pollination goals and make sure that things that are underrepresented or unrepresented right now get represented, hopefully, in the future. Uh, so that's what we're trying to do. And we'll collect 2011 seed pods, of course, and put those back out and try to hang them a little higher for greater seed dispersal. And of course, Matt's going to bring more than 98 juveniles back. So we're going to be very busy putting the young plants out and documenting where they are with GPS and with uh, these proposals. And they don't have that type, too, like cypress jumps. We have not done cypress jumps that back out either. And they're most of these. And then to continue to cut those up, the native or indigenous mycorrhizae traps and try to figure out what's going And I think that's where Larry and Dr. Zepp are already working on that. Uh, and they more direct seeding. Um, something Dennis was mentioning that maybe we might go to refine this with these. Once we know the mycorrhizae, maybe you can put the seeds with them and just kind of squirt the seeds together. And that would be kind of, so that would be kind of like low tech or maybe more high tech uh, uh, restoration of this very rare, very charismatic work. Lots of people have helped at the very end there. We tried to list the people that found these plants. It couldn't have started without the many years of Central Slough Survey. There are three days and two nights out there documenting uh, tropical endangered epiphytic plants. Uh, just people, non-paid people, as uh, Pat O'Donnell says, we wouldn't be doing this without the volunteers. The, in, the intense interest and curiosity that drives research, not only science, but drives us to everything. I want to see less of Paul Andreatis from Denison University. So uh, when you work on invasive python, you never have to wait long uh, for a splashy news note to lead off with. Uh, you know what we're up against here. Um, and if you're a glutton for punishment, uh, you can check out the, the, uh, the Ed Maps this is from Burmese Python to see uh, where it's been reported from. Uh, and of course, you all know about uh, everything going on down here. But uh, today's focus for this meeting, of course, uh, the left flank of the invasion front. Um, and so I'm going to talk about some of the work that I've done out this way. Um, and in spite of the focus, though, uh, uh, on uh, events taking place out here, uh, I am going to, for comparative purposes, mention uh, Everglades as well, because I've done, done some of the in both. So uh, uh, don't, uh, if I seem to be off target, you know, don't, don't pull out your big hook and, and, and yank me off, but uh, insofar as we want to be able to compare those two different areas, I'll say something about each. So, um, so uh, I'm going to talk about a um, little bit, uh, the amount of data that I've already seen, and you're kind of embarrassed to be standing up here, but, uh, uh, so I'll call it, it's rightly called the progress report, say a little bit about detection, status, abundance, uh, and sort of collaborative work on uh, possible impacts of the pythons. Uh, I'm based up in Ohio. I come down usually twice a year, usually once in the wintertime, once in the summertime. And I do different sorts of things at those different times of year. So it's mostly daytime work, 
uh, in wintertime and nighttime work in the summer. And so those are the, sort of the two halves of the talk. I'll say start with talking about daytime work uh, that do in wintertime. And uh, just to set the stage a little bit, y'all remember uh, the big freeze of January 2010? Um, and you heard a lot of people making a lot of claims about, oh, the majority of the pythons must have gotten killed. You know, Mother Nature uh, took care of them for us. Um, but fast forward one year from the big freeze to uh, January of this year. Um, this is on the, uh, the levee that's on the border between uh, 6L uh, agricultural area and uh, uh, College Seminole State Park, and uh, the volunteers and staff at College Seminole are in fact uh, extracting a pythons down in the grass there. And uh, I dare say that they, they would not have been successful in this endeavor if not for uh, uh, who can attribute their success to uh, inspired and stalwart leadership. Uh, big snake there, park manager way. <laughs> 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 so they did in fact extricate this animal, um, and I happened to be coming at that time uh, of year for my winter trip, and uh, Mo mentioned to me that, uh, yeah, we, we caught this snake on this levee, and it left these really obvious tracks in the sand, and so that piqued my interest because of uh, this might be something that we could use as a detection tool. And so here's the area we're talking about. Uh, this is the north west corner of Collier Seminole. And there's Kamiami Trail, and here's the 6L. So the black and white lines here are the white sand on top of the levee, and then the canal. And um, the reason that there's all this sand on top of the canal, and it's not completely overgrown with vegetation, is because they had recently dredged out the aquatic vegetation. And so there was uh, all this nice white sand exposed on the top of the levee. So in other words, their agricultural activities created this wonderful sand transit. Um, and another serendipitous event was that, um, so that ended in, uh, we'll think about December sometime in uh, 2010, and then uh, in the month of January 2011, very little rain. There was a bunch of rain around Christmas, and these are all data from College Seminole. A little bit of rain uh, early in January. Uh, they caught that snake that made the tracks and told me about it on the 11th. So I was there on the 15th and 16th, 14th and 15th of January, to go and look at the tracks, and then a big rain here washed them out, and I verified that in fact they were gone after the tracks were gone after that rain. So here's an example of a track which is a not very good one. It's not very impressive um, because it's old enough that it's starting to get wind blown and can't see very much detail. This is a really good one though. So put this one in your uh, um, in your search image. Um, that uh, you can get a lot of neat information uh, out of these tracks. And I'm a novice at this, but even I can figure out that, you know, from the indentations and impressions, you can tell things like which way this snake was going, at least in some cases, uh, because you can see where the, where the folds are. And you can get width measurements, at least crude measurements. So I walked uh, a kilometer and a half section of uh, this uh, sand transect, essentially, on top of the levee. And, uh, indicated by the extremes, indicated by the flag symbols. And um, each yellow circle is a place where I found what I'm calling, and if you want to talk to me, hey, how do you know those weren't big diamondbacks or cottonmouth or something, we can talk about that during the break. Uh, but I'm, what I'm calling python tracks. Um, so 10 in all, a couple of which are, eight of which are single tracks, mostly crossing from the canal side to the outside. Not, not some followed, but a lot of them cross. There were a couple that uh, were, this is a one track, I'm calling one track, it was in two different pieces, but I'm interpreting it as the actions of a single animal at one, one instance in time. And uh, another here, there are five short pieces that together make what I'm calling one track. It was sort of doing the same thing and leaving little pieces of track as it goes. So, ten tracks in all. Um, and don't worry about the data here, just the, the summary, the, at least I have some data I can show you. Um, so the 10 tracks, that one in two pieces, that one in five pieces. Um, probably the main thing to note here is that at least I can get some measurements of the widths. And these two, relatively similar, but I would say minimally at least three different widths of tracks. So minimally, this is at least three different snakes. 
Um, so let's do a little math now. Um, kilometer and a half of, of sand to transect. Um, maybe that short rain 10 days before I was out there washed out tracks, but I, I think it was probably too small. I'm thinking it was probably the longer time period, so from uh, Christmas to that point in time. Uh, so maybe 21 days rain free, more or less, at least not to obliterate the tracks. Um, 16 separate pieces of track, which is an overestimate, I think, of the amount of activity, because some of those I can pretty clearly interpret as single animal movements. And I think three is an underestimate. There's clearly, to me, to my mind, there's more than just three different sized animals. So my intermediate uh, uh, number is, I'll, I'll call it 10 tracks. And I'm not saying 10 animals, but 10 tracks. That's what we have to go with. So 10 tracks, kilometer and a half, 21 days. That works out to, for if you have pythons of this same density in, uh, in your land, uh, that means that for every six, you know, one kilometer, six tenths of a mile, that means one new track every three days. Which I don't know what you think, but that to me sounds like a lot. And in context, it sounds like a heck of a lot, given that supposedly a year before this, a majority of the snakes got killed by the big freeze. So, uh, yeah. you know, I guess I have some take home messages, and I want to sort of uh, direct this towards uh, uh, folks' uh, land, land managing positions. You know, it ain't over. Remain vigilant. Uh, realize that you've just been through the first round of natural selection for cold tolerance. And the ones that are out there are going to be that much better at getting out of the cold. Um, tell someone about it. I wouldn't have known if, if, they, if, if the folks at Tiger Summit hadn't mentioned this to me. And so sharing of information, obviously, and meetings like this are the, the best thing about them, of course, is, is the, the schmoozing and networking. Um, and so tell someone about it. And uh, at least out this way for, um, for exotics, uh, uh, I look forward to uh, when the, the Southwest SISMA maybe can, one example of an organ of communication, a bulletin board where can, people can put up sightings, at least for exotics. And then lastly, uh, in terms of tracking, you know, look down. <laughs> um, there's a, even a novice like me can learn a lot about these, these animals. They, and of course, in this part of the world, in, in this room right now, you've got some of the best trackers you can find anywhere. And I think there's probably a lot more that could be done with this. So those are some take-home messages that I want to share with regard to sort of my, my daytime work, what you do in the wintertime. So when I come down in the summer, it's nighttime. And I'm driving around looking for snakes crossing the road. So I've been doing this since 2008, and I target the late summer because that's the time of year when the pythons hatch out more or less. So what I'm doing is I'm <coughs> doing what herpetologists have done for, for many, many decades, which is to road cruise around looking for snakes crossing the road. But I'm doing it at the time of year, and I'm trying to catch that demographic pulse of new baby snakes that are out there crawling across the landscape. Um, so that can tell me something about both about where reproduction is taking place, you know, there, down there, versus out here, versus anywhere that somebody might want to be looking. And also maybe gives us a sense, perhaps, of how many reproductive females are, relatively speaking. What's the relative abundance in those two areas? So um, out here, I drive around all the rows in the vicinity of Tiger Seminole and <coughs> Cypress. And typically, the way that I, I try to schedule my, my sessions is, one night, I'll be, say, out here driving around, and then the next night, I drive down to Everglades and do the same thing. And so I'm trying to compare the you know, same time of year, same weather, more or less, and so we can compare it there here, hopefully. And I'm writing down all, all the snakes I'm seeing, of course, other reptiles. Um, and I also, the last thing I'll talk about is uh, uh, I've started, at the behest of uh, some of my colleagues, starting recording the mammals that I've been seeing as well. So here's the, here's the culprit, and I'm, 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 I'm an excited herpetophile here because this is the first python I found, I think. Um, but uh, rest assured, in spite of their, their, charming, uh, their charming looks, they're actually very feisty little devils. Um, so heading out in the evening, here I'm cruising the trail. Um, all, all the areas actually I'm a little bit off, I cut it off by using this map. So uh, I've been driving out to Collier Boulevard, out past Slippery Bay, and Fiddler's Creek, uh, 92 and Tamiami Trail, all along the uh, Tire Seminole, uh, all the way over to, sometimes I go all the way over to the county line, but usually when there's a station or a curvy store, I just sort of turn around and double back. Uh, so basically all the U.S. and state and county routes in this area. 
um, driving around, uh, and uh, here are some of the things that one might see. Uh, sometimes, sadly, you see dead, beautiful dead natives, and sadly, you also see live exotics. Um, but uh, there's an example of some of the some of the things that one can see. And if I'm doing it the way that I like to do it, I stay out until dawn. So I drive around all night. And it's not to say that you have to do that. I do that. And I often end up doing this by myself. And I wonder why that is. Um, but anyhow, uh, so one update that I wanted to give you is uh, this is a picture of the second hatchling python that's been found in the wild in Collier County. I found the first one in 2009. The second one was this past August. So here are the summaries that I have so far for um, the line, but for comparing, uh, so I'll just lump together Big Cypress and uh, uh, Collier Seminole, hey, I'm just calling your name Collier from that left hand column. Uh, a couple of hatchlings. Both of these, I should point out, none in Big Cypress, only in the vicinity of Collier Seminole. Um, and then for comparative purposes, so remember, usually like the next day or the day before, or within a couple of days, I drive down to Everglades and do the same sorts of things. And here are some of the numbers I've found down there. So, does that mean that I think that there are eight times as many breeding females in Everglades as there are here? Uh, no, I probably put in at least twice as much effort out here. Um, so, I'm, I'm really not in a position to say how much different there are, but at least I, I hope you can see where I'm heading towards, and maybe someday we can use this as a way to sort of gauge for different areas what the relative abundances of breeding uh, animals are in those different areas by systematically applying this methodology. And then uh, I promised I would say something about the mammals uh, because uh, at the behest of uh, uh, some of my colleagues, and especially Mike Dorcas and J.D. Wilson, um, who just offered a new book on invasive pythons uh, that's out now, um, they've been urging all of us python cruisers to keep track of the mammals we can see. And so we put together, we have a long laundry list of folks who have been putting, recording mammals as well as snakes, and putting that together, and looking at that, those numbers that we get, both spatially and temporally, to see if there are changes or differences between different places. And so this is, uh, there's my list of, of co-authors, some of whom are in the room here. Um, and so we put pulled together all of our uh, our road cruising data in terms of the number of mammals we've seen, and just uh, I, I put some jargon in just to make this all fit on one page. When I say core here, understand I mean Everglades. So there's a temporal component changes that have taken place in Everglades between the mid '90s and let's say the present. Um, and you're not you're not hallucinating when you say, well, where are the red bars? I don't see any red bars. You're, they're just very, very small or zero. <laughs> so that's the temporal change that's taken place uh, over, since the mid '90s in Everglades. So for uh, raccoons, you know, from green to red, the change in time, green to red. Rodents maybe not so much different. Uh, this category um, is all sort of uh, higher trophic level carnivores. So uh, panthers, bobcats, otters, foxes, etc. Just for uh, pooling purposes. So we have enough data to say something about. Um, so I don't want to get too far off on everybody. I want to stay with the focus here. But in yellow, these areas that I've labeled as I'm calling periphery for, for convenience here. They're areas that pythons haven't been abundant for nearly as long, like here. We have them here, but they haven't been here, and they're certainly not at the densities that they are. So um, so there are four areas, uh, peripheral areas, uh, Key Largo, the Chiquica area of Everglades, Big Cypress, and Collier Seminole, and the vicinities around those. And those latter two are the ones where I've been doing a lot of night riding. And so um, this, these numbers would thus represent Comparing, so if you compare yellow to red, you're comparing here now to Everglades, more or less now. And so you can see that while it's not as high as Everglades used to be, it's quite a bit higher than Everglades is now. But is that an indication of where we're going? I don't know, but we need to start monitoring it. So, um, so just some take home messages. Write things down if you. If, I hate to ask people to take time, but uh, keeping a roadkill log 
Um, count even the common stuff. Don't ignore the common stuff. There's almost an utter lack of data, uh, practically, uh, uh, historically, that we can compare to for a place like Everglades. But in, you never know in the future what might be useful. So here are some of the species that, that we think have been impacted and it might be worthwhile to keep track of. So, um, so with that, uh, let me let me thank uh, all the folks, uh, District Four, and especially Tiger Seminole. They let me use that as my base camp when I'm down here and put up with me and just bend over back to help me. And I, it's a treat to come down and work with them. So I wanted to thank them very much and thank you very much for your kind attention.